1960s and 70s, the federal government built four dams in eastern Washington on the Snake River, the largest tributary of the Columbia. These dams were the last of hundreds that were built in the Columbia River Basin in the 20th century, providing power, irrigation, and a convenient corridor for barge traffic to residents of the Pacific Northwest. In the mid-1990s, salmon and steelhead numbers in the state of Idaho reached historic lows. As a result, environmental groups and tribal, commercial, and recreational fishing interests have called for the four Lower Snake River dams to be removed. This idea has been met with strong opposition from communities dependent on the dams. Dams provide the power, they provide the transport for the farm things, they provide good jobs for Americans. A lot of the same people that are wanting the dams out are the same people that are embarrassed that the United States of America is the only remaining superpower. I say thank God that America is the only remaining superpower. And we need to keep our superpower status by keeping our dams in, by keeping our economy strong. Thank you very much. There's pictures in the newspaper you could literally almost walk across the river on the boats. They were so full of people fishing out there for the fish. And they're not here now. The people they're are not, not here. There. Why aren't they here this year? Sea lions. No, the sea lions <laughs> ate all the fish. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, they eat. They can eat hundreds of fish at one time. Where, what they're fairy big. land do you come, where do you come big. from? Fairy land? Believe me, I go into... I don't believe you. I think you're just as full of, uh, you're a walking eagle. I don't know what a walking eagle that's is. That's an eagle, that's a bird that's so full of shit they can no longer fly. Right they were built to stand. They were built to stand. They were built to sweat and blood. To serve the working man. Save our land. 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 The central part of our discussion will be the Endangered Species Act, a well-intended law, but one that has serious consequences on rural communities. We approach the Endangered Species Act protection from the perspective that salmon mean business. To make these rivers work, we need to maximize our investments to make sure that the negative impacts of the dams in the Columbia Basin are reduced. Eliminating the Snake River dams would devastate the agriculture in eastern Washington, and it would force the many farmers off their land and turn agricultural communities into ghost towns. Our treaty reserves to our people the rights that have always been exercised. The Nez Perce tribe continues to support breaching the four lower Snake River dams and investing in the local communities affected by that decision. It is no secret that the environmental groups seek to impose pain upon every sector of this region until we all support the ultimate goal of these groups, which is removal of the dams. I'm Reed Burkholder, and I think I was the first one to publicly make the case that we should tear out four dams in the Lower Snake River between Lewiston and Pasco, Washington. I mean, the story was, is that I went back to the Salmon River of my childhood, which is the South Fork of the Salmon River. And I went to the Idaho Fish and Game guys at the fish trap, and I said, what happened to the fish? When I left, we were fishing for salmon in this river, and now there's no fishing. In that year, I started researching what was going on downstream, and then I found four dams I'd never heard of. This is an old technology, an old, tired concept called damming rivers and flooding them to get two items. One is navigation and one is electricity. And then the conversation on those two items can go for the next six hours. <laughs> Thank you.
reason I got one is because I forgot to bring my other club. I forgot my good club. Should have had a live one if I liked it. So. But she strangled herself and went for a good din din though. The steelhead's like an Atlantic salmon. When they spawn and stuff, then they can come back out of the same river or stuff or whatever and go do it again. But with the barrier of the dam, those fish are unable to go back to the ocean and thrive again to rejuvenate again. And they pool around out here, and that's where we catch a lot of those ones that are just pooling around, lost out here, and nothing I can do for them. The only reason I ain't cooking it real fast now is because I ate all those damn salami sandwiches. I like salami the best better than bologna. A little tiny hot pepper in them or something. A little round thing. This is my hibernation spot. I guess my cocoon, I guess. When I crawl in here, I crawl in there and I just sleep hard and, and I gotta get past that waking up at 10 o'clock every day, but I work it late at night all the time, so. Here's a mirror I never use. <laughs> the Portland area director determined the facilities management branch to hear what state his intention to comply with regularly set forth in 25 CFR 2248.8 abandoned property, which states, no vehicle, trailer, boat, or other personal property shall be abandoned on the sides. Property abandoned in violation of the regulation in this part may be removed without prior notice to the owner and may be disposed of at the owner's expense. This truck canopy has been deemed abandoned by a federal law enforcement officer. Black, blah, blah, blah. This place is... I know I hate to live out, leave out of here, so, but if I have to, I'll have to move my operation someplace else. And the main thing about this place is this here is close to the cities. and I know I could make my my keep here is that I just wouldn't get bothered. What? Not done yet, huh? But you're all wet and you stink. Go away. We'd been saving for it for several years, knew that we were going to do this, and so we had money put aside to pay that first year's worth of bills. So we didn't have to start out borrowing money to operate the first year. And unlike most farmers, I've been on a cash basis ever since. That's the main reason that I'm able to operate, is that I do, I'm not servicing a bunch of debt. That and the fact that, that uh, my in-laws are willing to rent the ground to me for two-thirds of what they could rent it to anybody else. And sometimes that really bothers me. Really? Well, yeah. I'm, I mean, I know I'm not legitimately making it on my own. And that bothers me. But at the same time, I have to remind myself, in a way, I'm doing them a service too because it means a lot to them to have a family member here still on the farm. Yeah, keep it all in the family. To keep it yeah. in the family for another generation.
So I'm on a mission now. The mission is broader than salmon recovery. It's, it's, a, it's a foundation for salmon recovery. It's to, it's to show the notion that hydro is consistently a low producer of power. These blocks represent coal-fired plants in the next utility east of us, which is Utah Power. And then this block represents the actual generation of Lower Granite Dam last fall and winter. All these rivers collect right here at Lewiston and then they go straight west toward the Columbia River and the first dam they run through is this one and draining all of southern Idaho and northeast Oregon that's what it generated last fall cheapest power in the world uh, it's safe it's clean uh, if they want you know breach these dams we put what do do they want coal fired generation do they want gas fired generation you got to replace the power somewhere you know and, and and a couple summers ago we had a drought here and of course prices went sky high uh, people were you know, having brownouts uh, and people realized how important you know this power is you know? season stuff and we've been getting a lot of sturgeon and catfish and walleye and the market hasn't been too well for those so I'm just kind of just concentrating on the smaller hoops and hope the good ones come up to the dam and click and wait for the fresh ones. That's beautiful fish. That's not nice yeah. I get a lot of them paler ones and stuff but I will sell them old ones. And the only bones you'll have will be right here this here papa high part right here then on this piece will be right clear to here. You want another one? Okay. Two in here. Yeah. Go ahead and set that on the table and get some change here. Okay. Deadbeat. Do you know you have a name, Deadbeat? You're a good mama, you're not like your sister. Her sister's name was Deadbeat and she answers to it, yeah. Deadbeat. I wonder if she thinks that's her name too because I wouldn't call the other one Deadbeat. And I used to kick these cats, shoot at them with the BB guns, and they still come back. Black base. Black base. Hey. Here, get it. Get it, get it. You think those people were happy with their fish? To me, that just looks like a meal I sent off that I could have ate myself. With $15, I keep myself alive for a week and a half, and with one fish, it's only two days. I guess in this world, you always gotta have money and stuff. But money don't seem to make you as happy as just being happy, I guess, I don't know. I guess if I was at the stores all the time and I'd like to go to the movies and carnivals and the tavern or I guess I'd want money all the time. Here it's just I'm able to see it as a basic survival need and sometimes I get in that pop hungry mood and it's 
means I gotta go get some more change. I only got one fiber and a one now. If there was more money in fishing stuff, there'd be more Indians down here doing it probably. If my grandfather was still alive today, he'd probably be 110. And he started, he started fishing when he was a boy in Bristol Bay in the sailboats. He sailed, was in, a, in sailboats in Bristol Bay for 55 years and survived. Yeah. And uh, he never did see power. And then my father was 16 when he first went up with grandpa. And my son, he fished with me for about three, four years in, in Alaska also. But it really wasn't, fishing's not for everybody. You know, it really isn't. I mean, and you can't get down on somebody for not wanting to do it. You know, I mean, like I said, who wants to go get your butt kicked every day? You know, I mean, there's something loose up here. <laughs> you really do have something loose, I tell you. Seasons, the compact. This is their, their traditional downtime for us and for them to make decisions on the summer. To make, you know, how to regulate the sports and regulate the Indians and regulate us and to get this spring deal out of the way. That's just been a pain in their rear the whole time. And they also. got, oh, they got to be careful that they don't go over these impacts. And, they found out that last year during our tooth net fisheries that we did go over our impacts and some of the biologists just about lost their jobs over it. And we've done everything the state has asked us to do. They say put up a tooth net, we put up a tooth net. They say put up a recovery box, we put up a recovery box. So now you got a three, four hundred dollar box that you just put up. You got a two, three hundred dollar, four hundred dollar pump you just bought. You just put up a, a thousand, twelve hundred dollars just for the web. And if you were to put up the cork line and the lead line, it would cost well over two thousand for the net. Now you got three thousand dollars wrapped up in a, in a fisheries that they told you you had to have to participate. And now they're going to give you 2,000 fish for the season. That averages 13 fish per boat. That averages $1,200 a piece. Just to participate in a losing proposition. Sometimes you feel like we should just get a hold of the whole fleet and go fishing. Arrest us, all of us. You feed our families. You know, you, you take care of you know, you made the laws, you put us out of business, then you take care of us. That, they do that with welfare people all the time. Ooh, that feels salt. I've been thinking I might have to break down and sell my wheat here. i still got some left to sell. Where is that stored right now? It's in Palouse. At the co-op? Mm -hmm. When I sell the wheat, when I say I'm ready to, I want to sell this, the manager of the co-op then uh, picks up the phone immediately and sells that volume of wheat. And usually he sells it to an exporter in Portland. So how would removal of the Snake River dams affect that whole process? The main thing is that it would have to be trucked down river to the next available pool where it could be put on a barge. Or more of it would have to go by rail. 
We would still ship grain without the Snake River dams, but anybody who thinks that uh, it wouldn't have an effect on rail and trucking rates is kidding themselves. Everybody talks about removing the Snake River Dam. But the last time I checked, there were four species of endangered fish that crossed the Snake River Dams. There's 12 that crossed the four Lower Columbia Dams. Those four Lower Columbia Dams would be just as easy to remove as the Snake River Dams. They all have earth fill portions too. So if we're really talking about saving fish, why aren't we talking about removing the dams that 12 endangered species cross instead of the dams that only four endangered species cross? The answer to that is that if you remove those four lower Columbia dams, it impacts people in Portland. A large population base would have to face the costs of their environmentalism. If you can shift those costs strictly onto a small population here in eastern Washington, you can get away with it. I'm actually in favor of taking out the dams if they start with Bonneville. Because that's where it would do the most good. But it's not about doing the most good. I don't think it is anyway. It's about doing what you can get away with. Common sense the navigation. Let's just admit up front that wheat barges do go to Lewiston, Idaho. Okay? Lewiston, Idaho, right here on the map. Here's the lower snake heading off toward Portland. How big's Lewiston? Well, Lewis and Clarkston is about 50,000 people. So we've got this 140 mile water highway um, to connect a 50,000 person community with Portland. Now, how important do you think that really is? One barge will take uh, uh, 35 rail cars, and one barge will take 150 semi-trucks of wheat down the river. Fuel is the same way. You know, one barge can take a, a ton of wheat uh, real cheap. If we lose this river system, our roads are going to be jammed with trucks between here and uh, the Tri-Cities. Do you have any idea why the farmers are so concerned about the prospect of having to ship their wheat you by betcha. rail and barges? They're afraid they're going to have to pay a few pennies a bushel more for their freight. But that's the problem of being a wheat farmer in the interior United States. Imagine what it's like to be a wheat farmer right there. And I know one. Okay? There are no barges. You don't ship wheat by air which means you ship it on a railroad car, and that's the bulk of your cost is transport, transporting it to Portland. It's just one of the hazards of being a wheat farmer. Sad but true. How many acres total? We have a total of around 6,000. We irrigate about 3,400. Our primary crops are potatoes, sweet corn, wheat. But we are a true family farm, and people look at us as if we're a corporate farm. Uh, it's not, it's not the little duckies and the horses and the goats running around the little farmstead and people putting their, their vegetables in baskets. No, we put them in trucks, and we put them in... And, uh, and they go and they, they're cleaned and they're sorted and they're, uh, you know, it's, we still have turkey on Thanksgiving and things like that. And, but this is family farming and if, if, if you do it like they did it three decades ago, you're not here anymore. Damn, cancel message, I wonder what all that means. Maybe I'm better reading the book, huh? With that. What would be the impact to you if they were to take out these dams tomorrow? Oh, I'm done. Are you done? Oh, yeah. 
without water, my land is worth about $150 and uh, it's dry land area is not very productive here. And uh, you no, know, it's just all done. done. You support, in general, spending money on fish. Oh, you darn right. Yeah. Who wouldn't? Um, we've got a wildlife refuge that we've financed ourselves and we've worked with fish and wildlife people in, in setting that up so it was properly done and, because we like Bambi and, we, and the gooses and the turkeys. Yeah, who wouldn't? You know, uh, my kids and our grandkids are here. I want this river clean. I want it to be pretty. I want that land to be good for them. We want the same things. We want it done properly, fiscally responsibly, and scientifically based around common sense. That's, well, I don't think that's a tough request, you know? Hey, they're eating our fish. Yeah, I just saw them eat one. They're pretty effective. Yeah. Best fisherman on the river. Uh -huh. The anti-dam breachers are successful from very simple messages. And, you know, we have to just work on simple messages. The economics of salmon, you know, I think there's enough numbers and studies out there that we could put together a bam, 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 bam. Here are the economics. You know, here's what the power's worth. Here's what the irrigation costs to fix. Here's what, you know, and start throwing out numbers and hear what the fish are worth. For, for river communities like <clears throat> salmon, um, we, we, we could simplify this to only one message at this point, if we wanted to. That one message being jobs. Mm -hmm. Jobs for security. Your mm -hmm. Jobs and economic security. You can you can talk that in Chalice, you, you, you can suffer in terrible depression. You can talk it in Riggins and, and have it immediately catch fire because 25% of their total economic base is from salmon steel fishing right now. You know, and most people are only lukewarm to this whole issue. You kind of want to save the salmon, but we're kind of afraid it might hurt them or their power bill may go up. But if we can present this vision of a better future where they can catch fish that they can actually eat, where they can have recreation in their backyard instead of going to Alaska, and where they can have economic prosperity, it can be a really positive message that's appealing mm -hmm. to businesses in particular, which is an audience that we're ultimately trying to reach so they can reach the politicians. Mm -hmm. As a business person, pretty easy, you know, I mean, the more fish, the more business, you know, it's, that's just the bottom line. People that live in small communities like Riggins, we all eke out a living by doing all we can to bring food to our mouth. When we have to depend on things like a fishery that you don't know what's going to happen from year to year, it's really hard to know how good your business, how good your whole lifestyle is going to be the next year. The fishing is the main bulk of everything for everyone in town from the restaurants to the tackle store to the liquor store. Salmon is the lifeblood, so to speak. We need to get them going. I would love to see them come back financially. I mean, it makes my life easier, but it's more than that for me. I want to be able to see my grandchildren fish for salmon in Idaho because it's our legacy. If it takes removing the dams, so be it. I think there's a way to get around it to where everybody's happy. There's got to be. There's got to be a way to do this. And it needs to be done.
my truck crank all the way down and he got turned downstream. He got faced that way. He's already halfway to the boulder hole. Those guys could have netted him by the bank, they just kept digging around. That's alright, I'll hook it Usually we have to fight for this spot right here with these white guys. Last year they pulled out a pistol for really? a Mac, yeah. Go back to Rapid River. You know, I'll take my turns with them. But you know, other guys will come down here, they just jump in with their net, you know. Yeah. Bobby didn't respect them, just go ahead, please, go ahead. You know, so the last couple of days I've been getting along with them, so. Yeah, if you're gonna go, you might as well just hook up the Java. If you ask him what all he put in that one, I want mine just like that. Don't screw it up. And I don't want no special sauce. <laughs> don't put over the rocks. Here comes this little Indian car, stops there and parks. Jumps out, grabs the pole, and just takes off. I'm like, where are you going? He just kept walking. Man, I'm going to go to the truck and get my gun. You are going to move your car. As soon as I said 357, you come back up. Hey, that guy last night, I told him, I said, you drop in this hole today, we're going to play Cowboys and Indians. We all know how that ended up. <laughs> Outstanding. be another good year next year or decent which is pretty surprising you figure the crappy habitat we have up here all the all the farming practices that have messed everything up you know from 1980 to 2000 the runs were just pitiful you know and all these people that are saying the fish you know we we fixed it everything is okay that's a joke it's just a trend right now that's all it is we gotta wait and see the next 10 years how they're gonna do. The focus of this film is the Snake River Dams. Do you think they're a factor in all this? Oh yeah, the tribe has already made an open statement that they need to be breached, you know? But the politics of all this, pretty sad. You know, we had clear title of the land and when we ceded it over to the government, we held certain rights, which is to fish, hunt, and gather year round. And so that's a property right, you know? But sometimes you gotta be white to be have your property rights heard, you know? That's what it boiled down to.
These uh, juvenile salmon and steelhead uh, in the early spring of the year uh, get into what we call a smoltification process. They have a very brief period. Actually, if there were no dams, it's a long period. It's, it's probably about a 30-day period that if they just take off from the headwaters areas, they can get out through the Snake, out through the Columbia, and into the estuary. But if they're delayed in freshwater areas like the Lower Snake, place like this at Lower Granite where the velocities aren't very great at times. They spend too much time here and by the time they get to the estuary they can't uh, adjust to salt water and they perish. So what we've got here is an adult collection system that collects fish uh, on both sides of the spillway along the powerhouse and here at the south end of the powerhouse and guides them into a fish ladder they swim up the fish ladder and out into the reservoir up above. Well, the dams pose problems for juvenile salmon uh, in, in more than one way. Uh, water that's passing through the turbines, turbines are not the best environment for juvenile fish. So the fish are going into a collection system and are being collected downstream. And then at this point in time, are being barged down to release below Bonneville. What that does is transport those fish around seven dams. Lower Snake River Juvenile Migration Environmental Impact Statement, something like that. You know, how do we get the fish to and from, from Idaho to the ocean? One option was to do nothing. And the option they picked was to continue the same path, which is more techno fixes at the dams, improve barging, you know, just trying to techno fix the status quo. And and the proof of the pudding is short term, given good ocean conditions and great precip in Idaho, they're keeping the runs alive. Now, you get bad ocean conditions, and right now we have medium to bad precip. And the story, we'll read about it next year, we'll see what happened. Out of 100 things that affect salmon, 99% of them have nothing to do with people. And in particular, what matters for salmon, 100 times more than anything that happens on land, short of damming the river without a fish ladder, is ocean conditions, okay? They're very sensitive to what happens out in the ocean. And the whole history of the salmon crisis here in the Northwest is essentially that for a brief period of time, we had the worst ocean conditions in 500 years for salmon. And so salmon runs plummeted, okay? And then the ocean turned around, and now salmon runs are at all-time highs, all right? And nothing that we did on the ground and no government program and no regulation essentially amounted to a hill of beans compared to that turnaround in the ocean. my steering and he hooked it up backwards. So to go right you turn left, to go left you turn right. It's really hard to get used to. mess with a guy so far, but when it comes to aluminum versus fiberglass or wood, I win. How do you win? Ram them. They sink. They swim. I float. Bristol Bay is absolutely commonplace to ram each other. I mean, I mean, there's a line that runs from here to that pilot. You can't be on the left side of it. You can be on the right side of it. And there's four or five boats trying to get that drift. 
You go, you fake one way, you go the other way, you try to get him to do it, then you hit him and shear him in, you get the show. Oh God, you have that guy shoot at me multiple times. Guys shoot at you? Oh. I've had guys shoot at me for absolutely no reason. Are they shooting to kill or are they just... You would never hear the shot. You would never hear the bullet that kills you. You'd be dead. If they meant to kill you, you'd be dead. Have you ever shot at anybody else? No, I never have. We got turned in to the cops the other day for shooting at sea lions. Two big bull sea lions here, and boy, they were wiping us out. They took eight fish, and we got one apiece. Who turned you in, you know? Yeah, there's some, some tree hugger that lives. Some young gal who comes from lots of money, has nothing else to do, environmentalist. Uh, everything has the right to survive, whether you do or not, that's not besides the question. So what do you think of those Snake River dams, Frank? So you get them out of there and made more fish and stuff, but... You know, it's kind of too late to be whining around just about those dams where the fish and stuff. Look at all the fish wheels they had in here before the dams and, you know, just narrow spot stuff. And you don't care so much whether they take them out or not? Yeah, I'd like to do it stuff, but I don't want to have no really bad thing where all that silty bottom starts running off and poisons the rest of it or whatever else could be in those pools, because who the hell knows? Just think there's probably a thick old layer of poison way up there, then that starts blowing out and it's gonna come out and it'll be all busted up more and it'll spread out through the whole system. And you know, that's in my mind, I look at the ups and downs of it, but just never know. Whatever they breach them, the letdown's gotta be gradual and they gotta monitor it too and stuff and find out what's coming out of there. And cause you know what's gonna happen as soon as this here becomes declared totally polluted river, then and life as I know it will be gone. Probably at least 10 days, maybe seven. It's depending on the heat that'll come out on right here in front of the fireplace. It'll be tasty anyways, as long as the kitties don't try to get it. It always looks good to have a nice shiny piece of flesh hanging up anyways, and people look at the skin and they're thinking, ah, the fever begins. Hey, the salmon coffin's ready for my next victim. Where did you eat that one? I don't know, I would eat bologna, just slummy. Uh, bologna, man, you gotta eat food, Frank, like chicken, fish, vegetables, fruit, bananas. I had chicken of the sea, chicken of the sea, tuna fish. But can I please have a cigarette? Cigarette? Yes, Tawa, Tani. Tani? Tanis. 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 Like a niece. My niece. Tanis. Tanis. Mm -hmm. Tobacco. Tawa. 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 Natini. Natini Wini. Tawa and Tanis. Tanis. Would you like a cigarette? Please. Yes or no? I said please, yes or no. In my language. Oh, E. Getting to be the soft dough stage. Or as a lot of farmers like to call it, the zit stage. <laughs> Watery ripe, milky white, 
ripe, soft dough, hard dough, and then thrash it. It's been hot ever since this stuff started blooming. And there's aborted kernels in this head, you can see. This, uh, this little patch here looks like hell. This is not going to be very good wheat. If I normally produce about 16,000 bushels of wheat, then maybe this year I only have 14,000 total. So that means 2,000 bushels, at, just for round figures, $3 net. We'll be off about $6,000. And when your adjusted gross income is only $20,000, that's a lot of money. There's a, a farm credit service booklet on calculating all your financial ratios and whatnot. And it says in there that the return on investment in agriculture from a typical operation in the Northwest. And the return on capital is only like 4%. You can do that in a commercial bank account. Why take the risk in agriculture? It doesn't make economic sense for somebody like that to do it. So why do you do it? I think most farmers do it because when it comes right down to it, they're too damned independent to do anything else. They don't work and play well with others. <laughs> they're just, they're very independent people who like to be in charge of their own destiny. Which sounds kind of ironic because everything we do depends on the weather. <laughs> but uh, nobody else decides what you're going to do when you get up in the morning. And uh, I don't know. Don't know. I can't answer that question. And maybe that's why so few kids want to come back to the farm, because there isn't a really good answer to that. If somebody came to you today and, and said, Mark, I have we're going to give you the power to decide whether these dams come out or not, what would you say? I'd honestly have to say no. I really would. I would try to find some other way. If it means to put families and stuff out, out of business, no, I'm not for that either. I, because I know how much they're going to fight for it. They're not going to go down. They're not just going to go down without a fight. They're going to fight to the bitter end before those dams come, to the point where maybe there's somebody's going to sacrifice their life because it's their life that they're dealing with. These are independent people that you're talking about. These aren't people that go to work eight hours a day. These are people that put their blood, sweat, and tears into this. They're not just going to turn around and walk away. Do you have any idea, like, what percentage of the commercial fishing group agrees with you on that? Would Probably not agree? many. Not many? If you're in the minority on that? By far. By far. And why I think like I do, I'm not sure. I just don't think that. I just kind of think that there's a way, but every time you go to these meetings and hear the biologists talk, and you just get more and more discouraged that maybe there is no other way, you know? It, you kind of get to a point where we'll let the ax fall where the ax will fall, you know? And I'm sorry for the farmers, but Say, so kind of got to look out for number one, too. Gracious. Isn't this something? Look at them out there. Come on up and, and what you see. All we're seeing, we're going to get to see more of the life cycle than I imagined here today. This is really Look neat. Look at that. Okay, now what, you, what you're seeing here, let me, let me talk you through this. 
Um, now, first, voice, voice, uh, they won't hear our voices. Step lightly, they're much more sensitive to vibrations and low frequency stuff than they are to noise. Now, now, right here is a very big pair. There's a big five-year-old male here on a nest with a female. Um, check back to the left. Check back behind us to the left. Here's a, a pair of four-year-olds here, a four-year-old, five-year-old. There's a four-year-old here and another whole group down, a very large oh nest gosh. down below, okay? Back here. Um, some male-female dynamics here that you'll enjoy seeing. This is just like a Western bar at midnight. You're gonna see the guys fighting like crazy to, to, to drive off, you know, those interloper males who are, who are making trouble. That, that's what's happening right there. You have a big male chasing off a less dominant one. Yes, sir. Okay, look, we've got a light area out there, right? Yes. What makes a light area? Because when I look at the bottom, there's a bunch of stones. Do they move those stones yes, down sir. to the sand? Yes, sir. That clear area there is the area that, that the female ha, ha, has actually dug up, and all the silt that would normally be on those rocks has been cleaned off by the digging action of that female. She'll dig a, a big bowl. It's a big bowl in the river. She'll lay eggs, uh, fertilized eggs, and the male will, will, will spray the milk, the sperm, as, as she's releasing her eggs. And um, they'll settle into that bowl, and then she'll move forward and dig some more to bury those eggs with some more gravel for protection. So if you come back here in 2008 and see a big one, that'll be one that hatched right here that was laid today. Did it come back to the same spot? Yes, precisely the same spot, within just a few yards. And they, they, have a, they have a sense of taste, a sense of smell that allows them to uh, taste their way home uh, from the Pacific, all 920 miles. They taste their way. Isn't that something? Oh, look at that. He's sticking out of the water. How cute. When I first arrived in Stanley Basin in the mid-60s, um, this river was the most astonishing fishery I've ever seen. <laughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> the, um, the, the fishery was so amazing. Starts in the spring with the uh, steelhead in March and April, uh, followed very soon in early June by these giant bull trout. Then here comes July and here comes the spring chinook, uh, followed a few weeks later by the sockeye of Redfish Lake. And then the, the fall comes and the cutthroat and the bull trout and their spawning colors, incredible fishery. Of course, as the, uh, as the salmon dropped off, since the salmon are a fundamental building block in the food chain, it's not surprising to fishermen that um, cutthroat, bull trout, all the other supporting species have declined as well. It's uh, an ecological disaster that's looming for this watershed and many other watersheds if the salmon loss is not reversed. This is uh, critical from not only a, a recreational and a fishing and a, an economic perspective, but from an ecological perspective for basins like this one. These are our Chinook salmon and what we're raising. They have farm marks on the side of them so that they can hide in the habitat at this age in the weeds and grasses and rocks. From here until probably next October, they're going to be going very, very fast. And then when they get to the ocean, the ocean is such a food-rich environment, they really put on a lot of growth. The fish that we release that big, they come back as a jack a year later that big. And then you've got your three-year-olds and the four-year-olds four that are much more fun to catch than the jacks. Come back huge. <laughs> He's sure that fish is ready to spawn, and I don't know can't hang the fish on the hook. And he cuts the eggs out of it with one of those specially made spawning knives. The egg bucket, Kent just turns around to get the semen from the male crew there. We're using two males just in case one male, there's a possibility one could be sterile. And hands that bucket to me, I activate the semen with the water. This water will kick that sperm into action and we'll get just about instantaneous fertilization. The government screws up many, many things that it tries to do, and um, 
it's easy to screw up hatcheries. And uh, for a long time, the way that they ran hatcheries was you're the hatchery manager, you're out, your quota is you're going to produce a, how many ever pounds of fish, and the first fish comes back and oh, spawn it up. Second fish comes back, spawn it up. Okay, we're done. We can go sit down at the bar now, okay? And you do that over 20 years, and the fish start coming back earlier and earlier and earlier because you're, in a sense, breeding them to come back earlier and earlier. We had um, hatcheries breeding to a particular size that the commercials wanted, breeding the super fish over here. And everybody's off doing these things, and, and damage was done, no question about it. But if somebody sets out to run a hatchery and says, my goal in running this hatchery is to produce a fish that's like a wild fish. There's no reason I can't do that. Hatchery is an old-fashioned idea um, designed to perpetrate some sort of fishing after raping the land in one way or another. When dams were built in the Lower Snake, they passed the Lower Snake Compensation Act, which authorized more hatcheries. The hatcheries are coming under scientific scrutiny as being a non-solution for many reasons, and that's a scientific issue. we we'll have to find some scientists to discuss that. But it's not a solution to the problem. A solution means that we have wild fish filling the middle fork of the salmon, filling the main stem, you know, filling the clear water basin with wild fish. You know, fish that then have the ability to, to, to stray and to migrate and recolonize the streams where there are no fish. We are so far from that solution. They're coming back well enough to fish on the hatchery right here at uh, Rapid River, at Riggins. So Big deal. So many fall Chinook tried to climb the fish ladders at Bonneville Dam last week that some were injured or killed in the crush of fish. Counts at Bonneville surpassed previous record. Thursday, Friday, and Saturday last week each saw more than 40,000 fall Chinook coming up over the fish ladders at Bonneville. Fish were falling back and getting beat against the concrete wall. Wow. Dams that really reduced the fish population. I don't, I don't think the fish ladders were built to have 46,000 Chinook and a bunch of steelhead and a bunch of coho going through on one day. Bye. Mm. Have a good day. Yeah. Okay. Okay. There's a flat spot on this little ridge here. Yeah. And then there's a, another kind of flat spot there in the draw. And then I guess you can go right up on top of the ridge with the fish. Western Washington State Fair at Puyallup is the, it's the biggest county fair closest to downtown Seattle. And I bet, I bet 80% of the kids who came through there 
had never seen wheat before and had no idea what it was and what it was used for. That's why the wheat growers go over there and man a booth at the fair every year. And I got to work at it this year. There was this, there was a family came through there and they were, they were just passing by. They weren't looking at anything, but I could, I could tell that the father, or the guy that was with him anyway, had something that he wanted to, but what he was really asking was, does American agriculture still feed the world? And I told him that, well, yeah, in Washington, we still export 80 to 90% of the wheat we produce every year. And the next thing he said just floored me. He said, you do a noble thing. And I was just stunned by that. And he went on to say that he knew that, that the work was hard and there wasn't a hell of a lot of money in it, but in spite of that, that American agriculture is so efficient and our land so productive, he thought it was just fabulous that we have this food that we can send all over the world. And I just, I still can't get over that. You know, because it seems like I'm always picking up the newspaper and reading about how this environmental group or that environmental group says that we're, we're polluting the groundwater with fertilizer, we're poisoning the land, we're, we're using chemicals irresponsibly, we should be regulated more. It's a constant barrage of you're poisoning the planet, you're killing our children, you're killing all our fish! You scumbag, environmentally polluting farmer, you! You ought to be run off, drug out in the middle of the street and shot! But now I know that there's at least one guy over there on the west side of the mountains, on the urban side of the mountains that divide Washington State, who still thinks that being productive and efficient is a good thing. Frank, how are you? Oh man, feels so good to have air. The stars moved. Little dippers there. I'm still the only Indian that keeps track of time with the stars. One, two, three, four. That was my room, the fourth light over. Somebody was here before. I don't know, somebody got in here because he was digging around and my trailer's all... It's like they had a screwdriver. And got in there. All my food's gone. I hate to look inside, but shoot. So I've got to look inside, see if my fishing poles are here. I got ransacked really bad. I don't know who did this and stuff, but someone took my stove, my canners, all my fishing poles are gone to you. That's what happens when I'm not here for two weeks, I guess. What I'm hoping is that they can find a fingerprint or something in here. I'm not gonna touch nothing and let Grabbits come down here and do his job tomorrow, I guess. That BIA cop that arrested me, I think he's got a fingerprint camp, so I'll try not to touch nothing in there. I don't know. I just don't know what to think right now. I don't know, I'm defeated, shoot.
this was on my stove. It's my anger. We all did the crazy things in the 70s. Drugs were part of the scene in the 70s, you know. They were part of the commercial fishing scene? Drugs have always been part of the commercial fishing scene. 25% of the fleet is druggies. 25% of the fleet are alcoholics. That's how it goes down. The rest of them, hell, half of them can't make up their minds which one they want to do. You were one of those once, hey, right? Yeah. Been there, done all that, you know. When we were fishing in Kodiak in Alaska, that was before survival suits and all that. Hell, there were guys dying around you every single day. So what the hell's the difference? There's a heck of a good chance that I'm not going to make it through. I mean, we've talked about this before, and you know, I'm not going to live through this. So what's the difference? Party on, dude. <laughs> I'm Travis Brock. I'm a president of the Power Trade Organization. I don't think I need to remind you all of the good that our dams do for this region. You already know that they produce enough power to supply all the residential needs in Idaho and Montana. Also, these dams provide transportation worth $15 billion, that's with a B, billion dollars worth of goods as they move up and down this transport that's because the trains in this aren't region. Subsidized. Let them speak. Only and the they don't, uh, and they don't need to tell Jesus. you. Jesus, you got your own people. You got radicals crazy. that are protesting the dams. They're spoiled, rotten, rich kids that are delighted if they can take away from them. They delight in taking honest jobs away from forest workers. They delight in taking jobs away from port workers, from shipyard workers, from master mates and pilots that pilot these barges up and down the river for us. Good morning. My name is Bill Sadovy and I'm with Idaho Rivers United. For 15 years now, our government, the federal government, has produced one failed salmon recovery plan after another. This year, it's hurting people in places like Riggins, Idaho, in the pocketbook. Gary, Gary Lane makes his living working on the Salmon River. Gary, you want to say a few words? Hey. Yeah, Lewiston, what about the economy of Riggins? What about the tribes? I happen to be one of those rich kids. I don't even have health insurance. I feel rich in having some fish coming up the river, That's but right, yeah. the, the richness is the natural river. I'm Sam Mates, and I, um, I'm with the Save Our Wild Salmon Coalition, but I grew up on the Oregon coast in one of those commercial fishing towns that has lost thousands of jobs. We don't want to hurt farmers. We want Lewiston to prosper. I live in this region. I want these towns to prosper. But we can do it. We can have healthy salmon. We can have a free flowing Snake River. And we can have healthier, more vibrant communities for it. So, salmon mean business. Other people trying to make a living too. No, you're not. You're trying to do it with recreation dollars. You're not trying to make a living. You're trying to have fun. We're trying to make a living working. Then maybe we can take time out to have recreation. Oh, no recreation, all work. From the great northwest to the ocean so blue. It's a roll on, roll on, roll on. Everybody sing along now. Save the 
the fish. Save our salmon. Save our fish. Save the salmon. Save the fish. for breaking the camel's back? That's impossible to answer. But this is a straw that we know about. This is one that we can avoid. There is no solution, and there's no hope for a solution. As long as there are eight dams in the way. Maybe the best thing to do is let's just lower those bloody dams. Shut off the switch. No generators running. None. Let's do that for 30 days and see how people like it. And all of a sudden, you know, oh, Martha, I can't find the papers to go to the Sierra Club meeting. Why can't you find them? There's no lights! You know? What the environmentalists are wreaking on, on the rural denizens of the Pacific Northwest is a moral wrong. It is a form of oppression. If they remove the sacred river dams, that's what will result. You know, there will be that those people who, whose lives are ruined and destroyed for no reason. I've heard some folks say the salmon recovery isn't really about recovering salmon, it's about environmentalists uh, in some diabolical plot to destroy um, traditional economies. Uh, that always disappoints me and astonishes me and makes me angry when I hear that because nothing could be further from the truth. Salmon recovery is about sharing. It's about sharing the resources of the river system in a more equitable way. So the challenge here is to get past the polarizing garbage that's out there from stakeholders who have uh, an ax to grind uh, one way or the other and, and, and find a consensus plan that truly addresses the needs of, of all the people. It's been a year. Yeah, you just forget about how rotten you felt. You forget <laughs> about how sick you felt. And forget about all the pain from the surgery. Jesus, I didn't expect that. I expected once I had the surgery, because I heal always, I heal so fast, you know, that to, to hurt so bad. And so many people I talk to, ah, I've been a, and me too, God, it's been a good life. If I was to die tomorrow, it was a good life. You hear that a lot from different people, but that's not true. When it comes down to living and dying, you want to live. I don't care who you are. You know, you can say all that you want. But when it comes right down to it, there's nobody here that doesn't want to live. Just me personally, I'm glad to be fishing. Where did I leave that 12 millimeter wrench? It's probably gone to join the 10. I had it. 
had it in my hand. I keep thinking if I clean up some of this crap around here, it'll show up. There's a possibility you won't be farming that much longer? Who knows? Why would you stop farming? Couldn't make a living at it. Get too far in debt. Something Sell that's... out before I lose the whole thing. Is that something that is always sort of, a, sort of in the back of your mind? A consideration? Yeah. I haven't made an equipment payment to my mother-in-law for two years. If I was, if I was financed through a bank, if this wasn't a family thing, I'd be in trouble right now. You've got a box kind of like this under the dash of your car if you've got air conditioning. It just doesn't look quite this crummy. <laughs> well, I got a can of paint here. I'll get it. I'll put a coat of paint on it. It'll look 100% better. That's the last thing you buy before you go out of business is a bunch of paint. Paint everything up before you put it in the auction. So I know it wasn't Indians that still could do this to my filler. Okay. To the water. I have to fix my my back ties in there stuff is from that buoy. I got a thing off that piling over there. It goes that buoy and it goes to shore and I'm able to tie over the, the string that holds it open. But I know I'm short on twines and all kinds of supplies in camp and I don't have any, I don't have a knife to even cut off a whole webbing or anything and stuff and, and then anything to patch those holes and stuff, I'd use the string off of those fishing poles or something, I don't have any and, and I'm like the naked fisherman down here. So sad to see it like this. If they stole here once, they're going to try it again, so I'm going to be in trouble once I fix myself a place down here to sleep and I can, I did you hear, and I can hear everybody pulls up and I'm going to catch somebody somewhere. What I do, I don't know. I catch one. Maybe I'll do like I do with a fish, club it on the head, I don't know. Fishing now. 